Well, it's good to be here, and it's good to be here doing the easy part of uh, the conversation. I am not going to talk about beginnings. Uh, I'll leave those sort of uh, debates to other people. I'll call it the easy part of the conversation, though, in a sense, it's also uh, perhaps a little bit more challenging. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, philosophy, a little bit of uh, mining into the depths of the nature of science and the nature of uh, Christian faith, and trying to convince you uh, that despite what you may have heard, there is no conflict. Now, I need to get myself a bit organised, so I think this has got to go in the left hand, and I think this has got to go in the right hand, and I think I'm going to put my glasses down if I'm going to be able to read my notes. Um, and I'll be looking up there as well. As you know, there is, there is a war going on, a culture war anyway, uh, between the so-called new atheists and religious believers of one sort or another. Now, I think I've, I'm just not quite up to speak for my slides. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to suggest that although the conflict thesis is maybe uh, 150 years old, this idea that there is a fundamental conflict between science and faith, I'm going to suggest that it's really a communication problem. That when we think about the nature of science, and when we think about the nature of faith, uh, we will see that there is not so much of a conflict. It's a result of some shoddy thinking. It's a result of talking past one another. Uh, it's basically a communication problem. And I'd like to start by telling you a story I don't know if you know the story. Some of, some of those who have heard me uh, speak before will know this story, but uh, you'll just have to hear it again. It's the story of what happened when uh, the previous Pope decided to have a conversation with the Chief Rabbi of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to have to put this down and yell at you because I really need my hands for this. Uh, because what happened was they arranged their meeting and uh, the Pope went to Jerusalem. They decided it was going to be a private meeting. So they got together, just the two of them, and of course the Pope, he was Polish, the previous Pope, or no, it was the one before him, wasn't it? And he spoke Polish anyway, and he spoke Italian, and he spoke English and a number of other languages. And the chief rabbi spoke Hebrew and Aramaic and a number of other languages, uh, but they didn't have a language in common. So they had to speak in sign language, and that's why I'm going to have to put down my uh, microphone. So, uh, the Pope started the conversation by saying, and the chief rabbi uh, responded with, and the Pope uh, said this, and the chief rabbi said this, and the Pope pulled out an apple, and the chief rabbi pulled out an onion. And they shook hands, and they went home. Back in Rome, how did you go? How did you go? Oh, it was a good conversation. <coughs> I said, there is but one God. And he said, and he rules over both our people. I said, he's a great and powerful God. He said, and he rules over the whole universe. And I took out an apple to symbolize the beauty of creation. And he pulled out an onion to symbolize the mess that human beings have made of it. And we went home. Back in Jerusalem. How did you go? How did you go? In Hebrew, of course. And he said, oh, it wasn't very good. He said, I'll poke out your eye. I said, I'll poke out both your eyes. He said, we are stronger than you. I said, pah, you and whose army? And we both took out our lunch and we went home. <laughs> I suggest the arguments between the new atheists and Christians and other religious believers are similar. There's a large degree of communication problem. You know the conflict thesis, I've already mentioned that. Uh, some people go to the extreme of saying Christianity and science are in conflict, or even, and especially the new atheists, that science disproves Christianity. Uh, we'll hear from some of them in a few minutes. I want to start first though uh, before we look at the nature of science and faith and simply deal with this idea of proof and suggest that only fundamentalists ask for proof. 
I'm not here to prove anything to you. I can't prove that Christianity is true, and I don't think you should believe anybody who says they can. I don't think you should believe anybody uh, who says they can prove a lot of things. A lot of things, even in science, are simply not provable. Especially the interesting areas. Climate change, for example. I believe that human beings are causing climate change. Most of the world's scientists believe that. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change talks in terms of 95% confidence that human beings are causing climate change. In the next report coming out in the next uh, six months or so, I think they're going up to 97%. But they're not talking the language of proof. They're talking the language of degrees of confidence about what is the case. Big Bang cosmology. We think that right at the moment, we think that 13.8 billion years ago, uh, that's when the universe came into existence, according to the majority of the scientific types who know about these fields. It's not about proof, though. These are inferences to the best explanation. We can't prove God. We can't prove atheism. In the end, we make a judgment based on the best information that we have. And of course, if it were as simple as uh, proving something, then there would be no thinking believers. That is to say, if science has disproven faith, there would be no thinking uh, serious scientists who are also Christians or religious believers of any sort. But one thing is clear, there are lots of scientists, there are lots of philosophers, uh, there are lots of people who are hard thinking people and who are also people of faith. You know the names of religious scientists, here's a few of them, just to name a few. I won't run through all their names. Uh, you know the names of other thinkers who are serious thinkers, who are also Christians. Uh, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, Chesterton, Dostoevsky. Uh, scientists who are at the top of the field today. Uh, people like John Houghton, who was uh, co-chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, a, a, a group that won a Nobel Prize, in fact. Uh, people like Francis Collins, who heads the National Institutes of Health in the United States and was head of the Human Genome Project. These are very serious, world-class scientists who are also uh, very serious Christian believers. So, only fundamentalists ask for proof, I'm suggesting. There's a long history of talking about the two books of God. Uh, People like Galileo, Bacon, Boyle, Newton have all invoked this sort of idea. Uh, they often quote Francis Bacon who said, Let no man think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or in the book of God's works. In fact, Darwin quoted this phrase uh, on the front page of his 1859 uh, edition, the first edition, of origin of species. Einstein said, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. And Stephen Jay Gould, uh, noted agnostic, serious scientist uh, who, who uh, rubs people like Richard Dawkins up the wrong way uh, with quotes like this says, to say it for all my colleagues and for the umpteenth million time, science simply cannot adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. We neither affirm nor deny it. We simply can't comment on it as scientists. Science can work only with naturalistic explanations. Either half my colleagues are enormously stupid, or else the science of Darwinism is fully compatible with conventional religious beliefs and equally compatible with atheism. So, let's talk. Let's not think that the answers are simple. Uh, and today I'm here to provoke a little bit of conversation. I'm here to talk to uh, people who are willing to think about these issues and uh, not so much to people who think that it's just quite obvious and you can prove one side or the other. We need to take responsibility also for what we believe. These are important issues. Uh, although it's a conversation and it could, should be cordial, and although it's not about winning or losing, uh, what we believe 
really does matter. Uh, so, so, what we believe really does matter. So, let's take this conversation seriously. What we believe about world temperature trends really does matter. What we believe about whether humans are causing global warming really does matter. And we're going to see the results of certain beliefs and actions in the next 50 years or so. The other thing I should say, and I'm going to rush through uh, this, is I think science is amazing. I think science is great when it's in its place. Uh, have a look at this photograph. It's a photograph that you might have seen. It's a photograph of Earth taken from the Cassini space probe uh, as it's passed through the rings of Saturn. Those are the rings of Saturn uh, looking back at the Earth uh, with the little, uh, the little arrow there. This photograph is UDF J3954 and if you're not familiar with that, uh, it is or it was until perhaps the last month or two, uh, the furthest thing away from Earth that we have seen. We're looking back in time to about 380,000 million years after the Big Bang, if you're into an old universe theory. Uh, right, at the moment, we're mapping newfound planets. Every month we're finding new extrasolar planets, most of them in our, most of them in our galaxy. Uh, apparently, so they tell us, there are possibly hundreds of billions of extrasolar planets um, and uh, over a billion in our own galaxy. I won't go on about all the other wonders of science. I want to move on to uh, the nature of science. But let me leave you with this quotation by Einstein. Uh, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it's comprehensible, that human beings can make sense of this world that we live in. So science is great, but there is a danger of misunderstanding it. Hence, some philosophy of science. Firstly, science is not religion. That would be a naive misunderstanding of science that takes science because it's great in its area and extrapolates and says, therefore, science can give us answers to all the questions. If we look to science to give us answers to all the questions, we find that the universe of science is ultimately futile. In the short term, in the next hundreds of millions of years, comets or asteroids or a near-Earth supernova or glaciation are going to make life on Earth pretty uncomfortable. In the long term, in the next billion years or so, a warming sun, increasing greenhouse, and then eventually runaway greenhouse. And I'm not talking about what we're expecting in the next century. I'm talking about serious greenhouse effects before we finally get absorbed by the sun in its red giant phase in seven or eight billion years' time. It's not a good look if you just look from the point of view of science. And science doesn't offer the answers to the serious questions of meaning. Let me quote Richard Dawkins. In a universe of blind physical forces of genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. This is the world of science only, nothing but science. To quote Paul Davies, uh, a physicist, an almost empty universe growing steadily more cold and dark for all eternity is profoundly depressing. Science is not religion. It doesn't answer the ultimate questions. Let me quote Robert Jastrow, uh, a senior NASA scientist, astrophysicist, uh, who talked about the Big Bang, who talked about uh, the, the shock that it was uh, to scientists to come to agree that the universe did have a beginning. 
now we think 13.8 billion years ago. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. I want to talk about naturalism and relate naturalism to science. Science depends on what's called methodological naturalism. That is to say, science depends on assuming that when I am in my laboratory, only the laws of nature are at work. To put it another way, when I'm in my laboratory, I assume that God is not messing about with my experiments. This is an assumption I make as a scientist. This is called methodological naturalism. Now we need to distinguish between methodological naturalism and naturalism as a worldview. Something I'm going to try and help us with in the next few minutes. We need to distinguish between meanings and mechanisms. If you go into a physics laboratory and you put a beaker of water on a Bunsen burner and the water is boiling and you ask the physics students what is going on, why is the water boiling, they will tell you about the energy of the molecules in the water, they will tell you about the energy of the Bunsen burner, that the Bunsen burner is pouring energy into that beaker of water, they will give you various answers to the question. They will give you answers to the question along the lines of mechanics. If you pull out a cup of tea and say, no, the water is boiling because I want a cup of tea, which is the correct answer? There is no correct answer. They are both correct answers. One is a question about mechanics. What causes the water to boil? The other is a question about meanings. What is the purpose of the water boiling? If I ask you, why are we here? Why are humans on the planet Earth? You can give two sorts of answers. You can give a, a, an answer in terms of purposes and meanings. And if you're a religious person, then you will have an answer to that question. If you're not, you will say there is no answer to that question. And you can also give a scientific answer to a point about that question. If I ask you, why is she crying? You could, if you're a scientist, give me an answer in terms of tear ducts and what's going on in the biochemistry of the brain. That would probably not be a very pastoral sort of answer because the sort of answer I was looking for wasn't the answer that a scientist would give. We need to distinguish between these two sorts of questions, meanings and mechanisms. We need to distinguish between science, which is about meanings, which is about mechanisms, and faith and Christianity, which is about meanings. We also need to realise the difference between a worldview, which Christianity is, and which science is not. A worldview is a set of ideas and beliefs that make sense of the big picture, the biggest picture. It's like a pair of lenses or a pair of glasses that you wear in order to look at the world. It's a sort of interpretive key. How do we make sense of the world? We look at it through a big picture of our understanding of all the big questions. That's a world view. It's the biggest question, it's the biggest picture, and it answers the big questions, the questions about meaning, such as the purpose of life, of death, of human beings, of morality. Now you can see where I'm going. I'm going to get there in a minute, but where I'm going is to suggest that Christianity is a world view. Science is not a worldview, and we make a big mistake if we make science into a worldview. 
uh, many of the people here know roughly what the, the Christian worldview is about. It's about a creator God who made everything. It's about history being meaningful and going somewhere. It's about the purposes of humanity. It recognises that good and evil exist side by side. It recognises that humans are dependent on God. It recognises that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the centre of history. It's about questions of meaning and not mechanics. It's about questions of purposes and not the particles of the universe. And Christianity is not science. Science, such as physics, biology, chemistry, astronomy, searches for the mechanisms and the laws of the universe. It tries to answer the how questions. And it doesn't answer those big questions that I talked about before. But Christianity is different. It's much broader than science. It's not interested, for the most part, in those how questions. In the words of Galileo, the Bible teaches how to go to heaven and not how the heavens go. Let's turn to the nature of science. And also I'm going to suggest the faith of science. In a sense, science too is based on faith. That is to say, on things that cannot be ultimately proven, but are necessary beliefs. Let me just give you four presuppositions of science. Things that science cannot show to be true, but which science must assume to be true, before you can even do science. Science has to assume and cannot prove that the universe is governed, for the most part, by laws. Science also depends on a process called induction. The process of taking a million examples and making a generalisation from that example. If you see a million white swans, you conclude that all swans are white if you haven't met a black swan. And as you'll detect from that example I've just given you, once you find a black swan, you've disproven your theory that all swans were white. But that's the only way that science can work, is to take a whole lot of data and draw a general conclusion. Is that a valid way of reasoning? Well, science can't tell us that. Science has to assume it. And if you think there's a flaw in that argument, you'll have to ask me in question time afterwards. Science has to assume, this sounds like a bit of a philosophical topic, but it's true, science has to assume that there really is a real world out there and it doesn't matter what people think about it. Science is not relativist. Science assumes there is a real world that science gets in touch with and shows us, in some sense or other, the nature of that world. Science also assumes that we human beings can get in touch with that world and science assumes that human thinking leads to truth. Now, you probably haven't thought of it very much. Uh, these things probably seem very obvious to you. And I think they are obvious. But the point I'm making is that science can't show that any of these things are true. Science has to assume that these things are true in order to get off the ground. Science is also based on trust. Every scientific statement is a statement made by a human being who believes it to be true and wants other people to agree with them that it is true. Let me quote Richard Feynman, physicist, atheist, popularizer of science. Scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, some most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. And climate change is a classic example. We believe it to be true, most of us, most scientists, but you can't ultimately prove it to the person who's going to be a skeptic. But if we forget about the nature of science, we run into the danger of turning science into a worldview 
we run into the danger of turning science into religion. A religion called scientism. Scientism is a blind faith in science. You might come across it in other, under other names. Naturalism, reductionism, physicalism, scientism. It's a belief, roughly, that only scientific knowledge is true. And that any other sort of knowledge is nonsense. So science becomes the ultimate authority, and science becomes a worldview. A, a, a picture that offers answers to all the questions, even if some of the answers are that's a nonsensical question. Like, for example, the purpose of humanity. Let me give you an example of scientism, an example that occurred last week here in Melbourne. Some of you know uh, Lawrence Krauss, the name of Lawrence Krauss. He wrote a book called uh, A Universe from Nothing quite recently. Uh, he was here in Melbourne to talk with uh, William Lane Craig at the Melbourne Town Hall. He was interviewed uh, before the talk. The interviewer asked him this question. Is there a danger for a physicist wading into the depths of philosophy and theology. Lawrence Krauss said, no, because there are no depths of philosophy and theology. They are very shallow. I don't wade into philosophy and theology. I don't need to. That's the whole point. You don't need to do anything about philosophy or theology to do physics or to understand the universe. The naturalistic worldview is actually unscientific. It actually shoots itself in the foot. Let me quote Daniel Dennett, a philosopher, uh, a new atheist, and as a philosopher, somebody who should have known better than to make a statement like this. When it comes to facts and explanations of facts, science is the only game in town. Now, let me help you with this. What's wrong with this statement? I've tried to reword the statement. Let's, let's forget about Daniel Dennett, but I've tried to reword the statement in a way that those who believe that science is the only game in town might put it. The only things you should believe are those things that science shows us to be true. That roughly captures the idea of scientism, a total dependence in science. Now, of course, the question to Daniel Dennett, when it comes to facts and explanations of facts, science is the only game in town, the question is, is that a fact? Because I think you can see if you look at Daniel Dennett's quotation there, that is not a scientific statement. That is a philosophical statement, perhaps. It is not a statement that arises from science. It's a statement about the place of science, and it says that science has the whole place. But it is not in itself a scientific statement. And if it's not a scientific statement, and we are only to believe scientific statements, then we shouldn't believe that statement. Or, looking at the second statement, the only things you should believe are those things that science shows us to be true. Can science show that to be true? No. Therefore, should we believe it? No. Can you see that we're caught in a, in a circle of contradiction? These sort of statements are like the statement, I am now lying. They are actually nonsensical statements. They sound good, but when you analyse them, they are nonsensical statements, self-contradictory statements. So if you ask Daniel Dennett, is that a fact? Uh, he can't give you a sensible answer. Why? Because it's one thing to say that science gives us truth, but it's another thing to say that all truth must be scientific because that statement is not a scientific statement. All truth must be scientific. We need to remember the presuppositions of science and realise that you cannot 
derive all truth from science because science depends on truths that are outside science. But that's what we have going on at the moment. We have Richard Dawkins, you know the book, The God Delusion. We have the New Atheist uh, vibe that says science is everything. And we have this sort of nonchalant impatience of people, arrogance of people like Dawkins and Dennett and Krauss, who simply, it seems, lack imagination. They simply can't see that there is another way of seeing things. They've been criticised very powerfully by atheists and non-atheists alike for a lack of imagination and for their very poor philosophy. In fact, Michael Roos says, Michael Roos, an atheist, philosopher of science, zoologist, says, the God delusion makes me ashamed to be an atheist. The trouble with Dawkins is that he just doesn't take the things that that he just doesn't take the things that he's talking about seriously. I think that Dawkins does a, a serious disservice to the cause of non-belief by not being prepared to take seriously the kinds of things that believers believe in. You might have caught one of the big uh, arguments uh, on the scene at the moment. Uh, a, a non-believing philosopher, a very serious philosopher called Thomas Nagel, uh, who uh, does not believe in God, has written a book and he's copped a lot of flack from other atheists. His book is called Mind and Cosmos, and I haven't got the subtitle written down here, but I could almost quote it. If anybody can quote it more exactly, I'd be happy for them too. But the subtitle is why the neo-Darwinian theory is almost certainly wrong. Or why neo-Darwinian naturalism is almost certainly wrong. Now you can hear from that title why he's going to cop a lot of flack from uh, atheist friends. Why the materialist neo-Darwinian... Thank you. Could you read it out again loudly? Uh, why the materialist... Oh. Just jump off the That's it. Sorry. Why the materialist, neo-Darwinian... Uh, conception of nature is almost certainly false. Is almost certainly false. Now that's okay if it's coming from somebody like me who's a nobody. But Thomas Nagel is one of the most significant and respected philosophers of the 20th century. And he's written a book with that sort of a title as a non-believer. You can understand why. Uh, he's annoying people who don't want to take philosophy seriously, mostly scientists who think that science is everything. So let me finish. Conflict? No. Happy marriage? Yes. There is no fundamental conflict between science and Christianity. They answer different types of questions. They look for truth in different sorts of areas. And neither can claim a total grasp on all truth. In the end, with Stephen Jay Gould, science reveals the age of rocks, Christianity reveals the rock of ages. Or with Galileo, the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Or with Einstein, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. Oops. Here he is. Thank you very much. I'm not sure about uh, time for questions. I'll have to defer to uh, the moderators on that. What do we What do we say? Okay, we'll have some questions after Andrew's spoken, and I'll exit the stage.